The Leap Foundation proudly presents the Meet the Mentor podcast with Dr. Bill Dorfman. Dr. Bill is a TV host, New York Times bestselling author, two-time Guinness World Book record holder, fitness guru, celebrity cosmetic dentist, and philanthropist who founded the Leap Foundation. Here's Dr. Bill. Hey, Dr. Bill here. I am super duper duper excited to introduce you to our next Meet the Mentor. But before I do, I just want to tell those of you who don't really understand why we keep doing these, why we keep doing these. You know, Leap has been a phenomenal success. Uh, we did our 13th program this summer virtually. Obviously, we had to pivot a little bit. But for the last 13 years, we've been able to provide an environment where students aged 15 to 25 can learn real skills that they need to be successful in life. And we bring phenomenal speakers. Um, our next uh, Meet the Mentor, Agnes, has been a speaker at LEAP. We bring in businessmen and women. We bring in celebrities. We bring in um, artists and, and, and athletes and politicians and you name it. And, and I have been overwhelmed by the community support that we've received. I mean, think of this, we've had Mark Wahlberg, Anthony Hopkins, Eva Longoria, Kathy Bates, Paula Abdul, Michael Strahan, Apollo Ono, our mayor, Eric Garcetti, and on and on and on. And all of these people come and speak for free. Because like me and like Agnes, they believe that our future lies in the youth of our country and, and countries around the world. LEAP is an international program. And every summer we get about 450 students live. This summer, because we did it virtually, we had over a thousand students participate. And going forward, all of our programs will now be live and virtual. So if you want to sign up for LEAP, um, you can go to our website at www.leapfoundation.com or you can call our phone number 877-855-5327 and sign up. Uh, the next program will be July 18th to the 24th. It will be live unless there are health concerns, in which case it will only be virtual. But what I'm thinking will probably happen is that it will be live and virtual. I was one of the first people in LA to actually get the COVID vaccine. Um, and so I'm super excited about that. The uh, research has been phenomenal. And as soon as we all get vaccinated, you know, this thing will go away. So I'm hoping that this will come out to the general public soon. But without further ado, I want to introduce you to Agnes. Um, I've known Agnes for about six years now and actually met her in my dental office. And when she started telling me what she was doing, I was so blown away at how amazing, how intelligent and how good she was at what she did that I said, look, you got to come to LEAP. And she has been there several times. She's been there as a speaker, as a mentor, um, and it's been really phenomenal. So let me tell you who Agnes is. Agnes Cazera is the co-founder of Podcorn, the self-service marketplace connecting um, podcasters. And I'll explain to you what that means. Podcorn gives co podcasters the creative control to monetize their content with the right brands and enables advertisers to collaborate on organic ads. Podcorn's clients include brands such as Usual Wines, Sony, and Hulu. Prior to Podcorn, Agnes was the product manager at Google and is co-founder behind the Google-owned platform called FameBit. We'll talk about this and this will all make sense to you in a minute. FameBit became the leading marketplace where brands and YouTube stars collaborate for branded content and the company was acquired by Google in 2016. And that was a happy day for Agnes. <laughs> Agnes's industry accomplishments have been profiled in the New York Times, Forbes, Variety, Fast Company, Entrepreneur, FASCO, and many other publications. She has also been continuously recognized as one of the most innovative 
entrepreneurs in media and technology. And it is with great pleasure that I introduce you to my friend, Agnes. So just to put this in a nutshell, basically you guys built out FameBit and go ahead and explain what FameBit did. And then we'll kind of tell everybody what the comparison is between FameBit and Podcorn. Yeah. So we started FameBit way back in 2013. Um, at the time, you know, a lot of people thought of YouTube as a place for cat videos. There was some multi-channel networks and YouTubers started coming up as sort of the next generation celebrities. And I saw an opportunity at the time because I was a small brand. I had a small subscription commerce company and I had no marketing um, dollars to be able to work with these big stars that these agencies were representing. But I also saw a universe of creators who were up and coming, who may have had, you know, 5,000 subscribers or 10,000 subscribers who I thought, wow, like if I could only reach all those audiences through that one person, that would be magic. So um, I decided to put matters into my own hands and um, created a network of these creators who promoted my product. I saw a 20x return in under three months. And at that time, sort of a light bulb came on that, wow, this is this magical thing of creators that's driving my business. Explain to, because a lot of our listeners are, are, are younger students, explain to them what that means when you saw a 20x return. Tell them exactly you know, what happened? Because the thing that was so cool is, I mean, a lot of these young students know these big influencers. Yeah. Yours were kind of like micro influencers. These are people that didn't have millions of followers, but you're right. They had 5,000, 10,000, you know? And yeah. so explain how you got a, a, you know, a return so great on that. Yeah. Yeah. So basically, instead of working with one big creator, you know, like a PewDiePie that might command um a hundred thousand dollars for an endorsement uh i basically reached out to a bunch of smaller creators i think it was about 20 creators at the time who i asked you know what can i pay you to for you to review my product and i some were like you know i'll take a hundred dollars some said 500 and I picked a bunch of podcast uh, cre uh, YouTubers at the time, sent them the product. They put it up and basically did unboxings because that was a subscription commerce company. And out of all those, you know, uh, I ended up getting a lot of sales. And that that to me was magic. It basically showed that you don't need to put all your eggs in one basket with one major creator. It's really about finding a lot of voices, and in this case, podcasters. Uh, to to tell your brand story and because they have engaged audiences that I as a brand did not have and if I put out you know a standard commercial for my product um, maybe that would resonate but not really but an endorsement from a YouTuber that's sort of um, like a promotion from a trusted friend so it it worked and that's when my co-founder and I saw an opportunity to build FameBit and FameBit uh, was a marketplace that connected, like you said, YouTubers to brands for endorsements. Because the problem we solved is that if you're a brand and you wanted to work with creators like I did, it was a very manual process. How would you even go about finding creators? You'd go to YouTube, what would you search? Like beauty, depending on your brand or, um, you know, parenting. Uh, it's very hard to find the right creators, but then how do you contact them? How do you price them? How do you right. manage everything? So you you put all this together in a package. You started that company in 2016? Um, 2013. 13. And then you sold it in 2018. So 16. basically, 16. So basically, you had that company for three years. Yeah. And yeah. then you sold it to? Google. Yeah. Google. We, yeah. And we were able that to. That was awesome. I know. I know. That is honestly a dream come true it was a it was the perfect home for the company we were able to create a ton of value for the youtube ecosystem one of the reasons we got acquired is because although you know youtube had some monetization through adsense for their youtubers and they were trying to do some influencer marketing stuff but mostly through third-party um, affiliations and agencies there wasn't anything in-house so 
it was a very manual process, we were able to scale that for them. But they also looked at the broader creator ecosystem and they saw that a lot of the YouTubers um, were actually monetizing through influencer marketing because they weren't big enough to monetize through traditional AdSense that is very impression based. And, you know, it only favors the top of the funnel creators and then the smaller ones don't really get to make money. So that's really, we were able to do a ton of value, uh, bring a ton of value to the creators. And and yeah, and we joined Google, which which was phenomenal. And we were able to do a lot more than we would as a small startup. And once you did that, I'm sure you had to sign some kind of non-compete. How were you able to create Podcorn uh, and, and, and not violate your non-compete? Yeah. I mean, we didn't have a non-compete, so. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you were lucky, man. When I sold Discus, I had a seven-year non-compete in whitening. Um, I, I could not attach my name to any whitening product for seven years. I'm shocked that they didn't have you put a non-compete in there. Yeah, I mean, we had really good lawyers, I suppose, which. Wow, think- yours were better than mine. <laughs> so this is crazy. So basically what you did was you found a niche and you created a company that solved a problem. You know, we call it pain point. There was a pain point that you were able, and then you turned around and you said, okay, I see the same kind of thing going on in, you know, with podcasters. And so you created a new company. Now it's almost the same as fame bit, but why don't you explain the differences between the two companies and what your new challenge was? Because a, a podcast has a completely different kind of a format than, yeah. than, uh, than, the, than the influencers that you were working with before. Absolutely. So while at YouTube, you know, we saw the emergence of podcasting started blowing up. We saw a lot of YouTubers and Instagrammers diversifying their content and moving into podcasting, creating entirely different type of content, more conversational storytelling. Um, Their identities and personalities were different. We saw, you know, there was this long on average 30 minute format where you could do something super organic and authentic with brands. And then, you know, that I saw another opportunity like with Famebit because looking into the space a little deeper, I saw that there was a lot of the same problems emerging that we saw in the early days of video. There was this huge ecosystem of creators emerging over a million shows. But when you look deeper, 85% of them were not monetizing through traditional advertising because they weren't big enough to, you know, to earn through impressions. So I also saw, you know, that there was studios and, sort of agencies focusing on content creation and signing the biggest talent, but there was this void for the larger ecosystem. So yeah, we decided to build a sort of fame bit for podcasting and, and solve and use our expertise from the influencer marketing space to really bring it into podcasting because prior to Podcorn, there really was no structure within podcasting for direct brand and podcaster collaborations. In fact, the problem in podcasting for what we're doing is a lot bigger than the days of video because the space is incredibly fragmented. You have a lot of different distribution channels. Podcasters don't sit on one platform. There isn't a YouTube of podcasting. Like where would you even find a podcaster's email, right? Even if you listen to them on Spotify, you'll listen to their podcast, but you can't reach out to them. So that's what Podcorn does. It is a marketplace where brands and podcasters can collaborate directly. So we remove the middleman. And what we do for a lot of the brands is we actually remove the need for them to work with multiple agencies. You know, if they want to, let's say, work with th- uh, three parent, uh, like 10 parenting podcasts, they don't have to contract with three different agencies just to get all the creators. Because what we do is we're an open platform. We're kind of like an Airbnb. So we consolidate all the independent podcasters, but as well, but also podcasters that are with agencies and, and we drive business to them. I love that. Uh, funny question. Where did the name Podcorn <laughs> come from? I mean, um, obviously it sounds like popcorn, but yeah. was yeah, that so, it? Yeah, I think that was it. It was sort of wanted the word podcasting in there and and popcorn for entertainment and and this idea that it's this next big emerging um, entertaining medium. And and that's kind of how it was born and it had a ring to it. And it it sort of stuck by accident, I suppose. 
Oh my gosh. I have to tell you a quick popcorn story because every time <laughs> I hear the word popcorn, I think of this. So when my kids were little, um, I used to, you know, take them to all of these like Disney cartoon movies and stuff. And usually I was, I was working like 20 hours a day at the time. I was so exhausted. I would literally go to these movies, sit down with the kids, they'd watch the movie and I'd fall asleep, right? <laughs> so I'm at this movie and I, I, halfway through it, I kind of woke up and all of my kids are eating popcorn. I didn't buy popcorn. And I said, where did you guys get your popcorn? They're like, oh, dad, it's free. It was just on the floor here. Somebody oh had left God. like a bucket of popcorn. I was mortified. My kids are eating this popcorn. That is terrifying. Oh, gosh. Oh, I wow. didn't tell the mom. Um, OK, so <laughs> one of the things I love about doing these Meet the Mentors is and I think this is a real point of differentiation with my podcast and some of the others, is I really want students to be able to walk away with some solid, like, pearls. And, you know, I want you to go back to the beginning, fame bit. Mm -hmm. You know, you had this great idea. You decided you were going to build this company. Can you kind of take us through the steps that you had to do? And I mean... Like, in as much detail, like, you know, the first thing you're going to do when, when you start to form a company is you're going to come up with a name. Okay, now you have this name, Famebit. The first thing you need to do is trademark that and lock that up. You know, you want to get the domain. You want to get, just kind of go through some of those steps so that students that are listening that may have an idea for a comparable kind of company or any company will kind of have a sense for what they really need to do to, you know, get off and running. Yeah, I think the biggest thing, and I think it's been the same for both Famebit and for Podcorn is the big first step when you have an idea um, is to research the market, right? Is to go out and see what is the competition like? Who else is doing something in this space? How are how can you be different? How can you have a different narrative than everyone else? What is what void can you fill? And if the space is crowded already, um, then exactly like how can you differentiate yourself? Because at that point, you know, it's it's great to do market research first. It's nice to have an idea, but if you do it in a tunnel and you don't look at whatever it is out there, you might invest a lot of resources and then you realize, oh shoot, um, this space is gonna be hard to compete in. So yeah, that's- And one of the things that we did with my company, Discus, is the old, let's build a better mousetrap. There are yeah. mousetraps, but if you can build the best mousetrap, you've got a business, right? Absolutely. Yeah. And after you realize, you know, I can do something different and unique here. Um, I think the best thing to do next is figure out what is the minimum thing that you have to do in order to get to users or customers. So whether it's, you know, talking to them, cold emailing customers and seeing if there's a need for your product or getting people to say yes to you to working together. I think at the beginning stages, before you even have a product, you want to figure out how to do things that might not necessarily scale, but for you to get some data, whether it is, you know, whether you're going to have product market fit, whether there's an actual need um, and, and whether people are going to buy this. And I think that's the thing we did with both even Podcorn and Famebit is that we cold emailed influencers and podcasters and we said like how are you monetizing right now do you have this problem um and and we basically surveyed a lot of people same with brands even you know before podcorn was built um we got contracts with brands like testing budgets something small even like five thousand dollars to start with just to prove it out and you know i would do the legwork of going out and getting the creators to say yes and i would manage the campaign from start to finish something that the product would eventually do um but that's how i got it started and and you prove the concept and then once you prove that concept you can go to investors and you know i think a lot of people 
kind of have this fear that, you know, if I'm a first time founder or I don't have these connections, honestly, it doesn't matter. If you have a great idea and you're solving a real problem, people will write you a check. So it, it doesn't matter how experienced you are. It's just, you have to go with the idea. Um, so yeah, I think, I think those things are critical to, to getting money. So once you've established a brand, you have an idea for a business, you do a little bit of market research and now you're like, I know you had a co-founder and you worked with him. Yeah. Now you guys are like, okay, we've got a business. We, now what? How do you start? Yeah. So you build out the product, you hire a team. I think that's, I think a big part of hiring a team is hiring people that you want to be friends with. I think, you know, a lot of stuff that I learned along the way is you need to, like people are the most important thing um, in the company. So you need to hire people that you're going to want to work with. And if you have a gut feeling that someone's a little bit off or, or, you know, something's a little bit weird, then you need to act on it really early because company culture is everything when you're, you know, a three or four or five person team, um, having wrong people is critical because every, every person counts. So I think really investing and figuring out what is your skill set? What is it that you are good at? I think at the beginning, when you uh, start a company, you're going to have to wear many hats and you're going to have to be uncomfortable learning a lot of things from whether it's marketing and figuring out like, what is the narrative? What is our go-to market strategy for launch? Are we going to hire a PR firm or um, who is our customer? You know, you want to figure out who are you going to speak to with your narrative? I think building the narrative is very important prior to launch. Um, so figuring out maybe you're good at that, but maybe you might be not good at the operations and the finance side of things. So maybe you look for a co-founder that has that aspect, or you look for a technical co-founder. Like in my case, I didn't have a technical background. Um, I had more of an actual legal background, but then I learned everything else. And I think that's the other important thing is that you don't need to be good at startups. There is no startup school. You, you actually learn as you go along and then you fill the voids with the people that you need along the way. So, yeah, I, I think, think that's so true. And, you know, and I think like for me personally, you know, when I started up Discus Dental, I mean, obviously I knew the dental cause I was a dentist. I didn't know how to run a multi-million dollar company. And, you know, my business partners were more business people. I was more of the techno. But at the same, at, at the same time, I didn't want to feel like I couldn't add to the business that, that we were doing. So I went back to school. You know, I took, yeah. I took UCLA extension courses in, in business and accounting and finance and all these things that I had absolutely no background in at all because yeah. I felt like an idiot. I'm sitting in these board meetings and I mean, yeah, I understood all of the dental. I understood all of the chemistry. I understood all of the manufacturing. But when it came to like charts and graphs and how much money we we're making, I'm like, no. So yeah. I, I think that's a really good point. And you, you're right. You don't have to know everything right out, uh, out of the gate. And I think it's important to surround yourself with great people. You know, um, one of the things that we say in business is hire cautiously and kind of slowly. And what I've learned as an employer is, even when I bring people into my dental office, I give them like a one month trial. Like a, it's like a working interview for a month to really make sure that we all fit together and, you know, hire slowly, fire quickly. You yeah, know, absolutely. not everybody is going to be a great fit. And, you know, you can't feel bad about that, but you really need to look at what the company needs and, and the dynamics of how people work together. That's so important. Yeah. People are the most important part of your business. Yeah. Another thing I'll say is, you know, once you've already figured out that there is something there in your idea and that this could be viable and you want to build a company, if you don't know where to start or you're just starting out, I say apply to an accelerator. Because for me, the first time around, that was critical. Not only do you get the legal resources um, to walk you through the entire incorporation process, you know, but you also get mentorship 
from founders that have been in the exact same spot and have done it before. So whether your company is a marketplace or an e-commerce, whatever it is, there are people in your vertical who have done this, who can walk yeah, through in the steps. If you could explain, because a lot of, we've talked about this before and yeah. how critical it was for you, but you know, a lot of my students have no idea what an accelerator is. So maybe you can explain that and how they can actually find one for their business if they start one. Yeah. Yeah. So there's lots, you know, some of the top ones, um, why, why Combinator, 500 startups. I went through 500 startups. They have been incremental. I actually um, joined them again, even as an experienced founder through Podcorn, just to have the access to the network. You know, um, it's, it's incredible. Uh, but essentially an accelerator is, you can think of it as a startup school, as, as close to startup school as it gets. Um, it's a several month program that you join and they basically walk you through the cycle of your company up on depending on where you are i think there's you know people sometimes join pre-product before they have a product some people join when they have a product but they need marketing um help so depending on there's companies in different stages but you go through several months of development there with people who you know have office hours and you can go in and ask questions so whatever it is that you're struggling with whether it's like how to get users because not enough people are using your product or how to market it or how to find engineers they'll be able to connect you to the right resources so you go through these several months they have speakers weekly or sometimes daily uh, from different industries or different areas that talk about like finance they teach you accounting um, so they teach you a lot of the things that you actually need to do on in every day to operate a startup. And then at the end, you have a demo day, which allows you to present to a room full of investors that you as a first time founder would never have access to because, you know, I can tell you firsthand that cold emailing investors is very difficult. Even if you have the best idea, people sometimes, you know, don't open it because they don't know you. So um, so they'll, they won't open your email. But if you have an opportunity to present in front of all these investors, um, then you're more likely to get funding. And in fact, my first company, that's exactly how I raised funding was through Demo Day. It was super successful for me. So, so I know it works. Obviously, the second time around, it was a little bit easier. And um, I already had a Rolodex of investors and, and people who trust, trusted um, my expertise in this space. So I was able to raise before building um, Podcorn. We raised 2.2 million prior to even starting wow. to build the company. Yeah. That's so amazing. And so what's the best way to find an accelerator? Um, just look up top accelerators on, <laughs> on um, Google, you know, um, and you'll come up with a list. But as I said, like Y Combinator, 500 startups, um, those are those are really top accelerators. That and I do you have to pay to 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 join an accelerator or, or this is free or how does no. it work? So they actually give you money. Um, so if you're selected, they give you funding um, for your startup. Uh, it always changes. I don't know, it used to be like 50 grand. Now I think it's more. Don't quote me on exactly how much they give you, but they give you funding to get started. Um, you do have to pay a small portion back with a lot of the programs just for um, the using their facilities, et cetera, because they give you office space. Um, but it's a very, very tiny, small portion and they get a certain equity in your company. Wow, that's exciting. All right, so Podcorn is going. Yeah. Is it gonna go to uh, Google, Facebook? I mean. <laughs> Do we know? I mean, we don't know yet. So we launched in December, 2019. We honestly had a phenomenal launch. Within just four months, we were already growing three times faster than we were with Famebit on the creator side, which I think that really goes to show the demand in the space is even bigger than it was in the days of video when we started. Um, I think another um, thing I would say, because we've done a lot of strategic partnerships throughout our launch that we didn't think of with Famebit as early on that have been incremental in our growth here. So that's the other thing, like we partnered with hosting providers such as Buzzsprout, Podomatic, RSS, and others who already have the podcasters, but don't have monetization tools that we're able to help. So that's the other advice I would have is to think about partnerships really early on with other startups that are complementary to you that you can both feed off of each other. 
um, because that has been really helpful. But yeah, we are ramping up and growing. We already have customers like Hulu. Um, we just signed Amazon and, and Sony. So yeah, it's it's going really well. We'll see, you know, if I obviously saw the value of um, getting plugged into a much bigger machine, like a, a Google and the things you can do through their data and that you can't do uh, on your own as a startup. So I'm definitely open to the right strategic acquisition. I think the exciting thing about podcasting because of the fragmentation is that there's a lot of more potential acquirers. Right, right, um, right. Because with YouTube, it was like, you know, it's the only one. We're leveraging their API. So at some point, you never know what could happen if they cut you off or or, or what. But also, that was the perfect home for, for FameBit. But here, there's there's a lot more, I think, acquirers, which is exciting. Okay, so let's say hypothetically that Podcorn gets sold by mm -hmm. the end of the year. Yeah. What's next for Agnes? Um, you know, I think it depends. Like, I, I definitely, I think if I got acquired, then I'd love the opportunity to grow within um, the the new partner to grow the company even bigger than fame bit. I think that's always, you know, you always want to go even bigger with your next one. It's you just have a playbook for how to scale in a way that you don't the first time around. So I definitely would want to take it longer term and make it even bigger. But down the road, I think another startup, um, it's very addictive. I think as a founder, you kind of when you're in it, you forget how hard it is. Or when you're out of it, you forget how hard it was to start a company and you want to do it again. So I feel like that will probably happen to me. Um, but I love the process of creating something out of nothing. Um, and that's that's very special to me. And I think you can only do that with, with starting companies. So I definitely see myself doing it again. All right. Well, when we go offline, I have two ideas for you. I'm going to run oh my by you. Yay. Awesome. Pretty cool. Can't wait. All right, Agnes, thank you, thank you, thank you. I love that you are so immersed in this. I love that you give back. You know, my new mantra is learn so you can earn and then return. And you have fulfilled that and coming and speaking at Leap and sharing your knowledge and your passion and all that with my students is something that I really hold near and dear to my heart, and I can't thank you enough for that. And I look forward to many more years of that. I love watching you become so incredibly more and more and more successful. And um, yeah, with that, Dr. Bill, over and out. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. To learn more about the Leap Foundation, go to leapfoundation.com or find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash leapfoundation or on Instagram at leapfoundation. Listen to the Meet the Mentor podcast with Dr. Bill Dorfman on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts.